Welcome to this uh, event here at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. My name is Jörg Pontrick. I'm director of the Central and Eastern Europe uh, at GMF, and I have the pleasure of leading you all through this uh, uh, discussion uh, this afternoon. Before we go into substance, uh, I would like to get some technicalities out of the way. Uh, first, uh, in terms of time frame, we aim for about 75 minutes with this uh, event. Uh, if obviously there is a very intense, fruitful discussion that requires for us to take a little more time, we have a reserve, we can go over time uh, a little bit. Uh, second, the uh, event will be recorded online. We had a number of requests from people who cannot join us at this stage, uh, but wanted to uh, watch our discussion uh, online. So please be aware that uh, this is a recorded uh, discussion that will then be placed on YouTube uh, and the internet. Um, third, uh, when it comes to the question and, uh, and discussion session later on, uh, we will exclusively use the chat function. Uh, please, in the course already of our, uh, of our presentations, then also the discussion, uh, feel free to type up your questions in the chat functions. Uh, the speakers, myself, we will follow those. Uh, I will then also paraphrase them for, for everybody's benefit uh, and post them to the, uh, to the speakers. Uh, this is typically more uh, time efficient than uh, bringing you all in for uh, questions directly. So thank you for your understanding of that uh, functionality. Uh, now with that, let me return to what we're all here uh, really for. Uh, this is another event in the uh, framework of our Rethink CE Fellowship. Uh, this is a fellowship program that at the German Marshall Fund we uh, established a couple of years ago with the idea of bringing in more next generation experts, analysts, activists, uh, and give them an opportunity to uh, take some time, uh, uh, produce a unique piece of research on current challenges in Central and Eastern Europe uh, at large. Uh, we're now in our third year um, with this program. Uh, and we've had a fascinating experience so far. Some of you may have been uh, part of online discussions and presentations earlier on. So uh, if, you, uh, if you have been, welcome back. Uh, all those uh, who are new to this, uh, uh, welcome once again. Um, within this fellowship program, Rethink Central and Eastern Europe, um, uh, we have actually two fellows here today who joined us. Uh, one is Alexander Herasimenka, uh, the other one is Veronika Laputska. Uh, both of them uh, are current fellows in this uh, in this program. So, uh, particularly uh, heartfelt welcome to Alexander, who's online, and uh, Veronika will uh, certainly join us in a second. Uh, Alexander is a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Oxford University in the field of computational propaganda. Um, he's also a research associate at the University of Westminster. Uh, originally, he is from Belarus. Uh, you will have seen the title of the session. This is obviously one of the countries that uh, uh, he's looking at particularly closely, especially these days. Uh, Veronika Laputska, who hopefully will join us still, uh, is uh, also from Belarus originally. Uh, she's a co-founder of the Eurasian States in Transition uh, uh, Research Center based out of Warsaw these days and also associated with our good colleagues uh, at the GMF office in, uh, in Warsaw. Uh, now, the theme of our session today is in Belarus and other autocracies, the power of uh, digital resistance. Um, I don't need to uh, retell the story of the last weeks that you will all have uh, certainly come across in, uh, in the news, this remarkable development that we've all seen in, uh, in Belarus that is still unfolding. Um, these, are, these are events, I think, that have been fascinating for, for many of us uh, from a whole number of angles. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the elements that has obviously captured uh, uh, many uh, in Belarus and outside is the strong role of women, uh, a very pronounced sort of women's revolution almost. Uh, but there are other aspects that I think have been equally puzzling for, uh, uh, for a lot of people. Uh, there's questions that, uh, that have emerged about who are the actual leaders of this, uh, of this movement, what are the, uh, the organizational structures uh, uh, underlying this countrywide mobilization of society. 
uh, there's observers who have obviously seen the strong role of, for instance, telegram channels in uh, providing information about events, also partly co-organizing many of these uh, many of these protests. Uh, and obviously, uh, a lot of people have been surprised also by experience from from Belarus about the uh, the countrywide very horizontal nature, the reach of these uh, of these protests. Typically, in the past, the uh, protests that have taken place uh, were much more limited, typically even to the capital Minsk only. So uh, there is uh, there is a number of characteristics uh, that that uh, uh, that remain a little in the shadows. That uh, questions that are still not fully answered in many ways. Uh, and interestingly enough, these are exactly some of the aspects that uh, Alice is covering in his uh, in his uh, paper. He has just published a policy paper with the German Marshall Fund uh, that looks very closely at uh, digitally enabled organizing of democratic movements uh, in different shapes across different countries. This paper is, is fascinating also because it does not look just at one country, but uh, uh, at others, including Ukraine, Turkey, uh, Russia. Uh, so these are uh, these are questions that just gained a particular currency, as it were, with uh, uh, with the events that we have seen unfolding in uh, in Belarus. Uh, and for that reason, I uh, I asked him in his uh, brief introduction and overview of the, the paper and its findings uh, to to use perhaps Belarus as a particular illustration because these are events just unfolding. So. Uh, I think for for all of us, this is a particularly good uh, good hook, as it were, to uh, to look at this broader issue of uh, what Alice in his paper also calls digital dissidence. Um, after that, provided she's still joining us, Veronica will uh, uh, provide commentary on uh, on this paper. Uh, interestingly enough, she has uh, she is currently working uh, on a study for us that looks at influencers, at their uh, social and political sort of significance and reach and, and impact uh, across Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, a very closely related uh, aspect, obviously, to those questions that Alès is looking at in his paper. And then after that, we will uh, open it for questions uh, from uh, from all of you, uh, as I mentioned, through the chat function. Please do feel free anytime to provide your questions, also commentary, perhaps, if you want. Uh, with that, I will pass it on to uh, Alice. Um, and you give us the upshot of your uh, paper that just came out two days ago. Alice, the floor is yours. Um, uh, hello, hello, everyone, and thank you. Thank you for this introduction. Um, yeah, indeed, I've been doing research into digital movements and how people get organized, mobilized using digital technologies for a long time. Uh, my, my research concerns the Euromaidan movement in 2013-14 in Ukraine, uh, uh, Belarusian events in 2017, um, uh, Russian protests in 2017-18, and currently I'm doing research into the use of uh, digital media, specifically Telegram, a messaging platform in Belarus. And during all those events, uh, when I was trying to, I was trying to understand um, how does the organizational structure of civic activism broadly, not just protest activism, but civic activism changes uh, with time, because Many of those uh, movements and organizations I mentioned, they've been relying extensively on digital platforms, on social media, but also on websites in general, internet, and increasingly these days on messaging platforms. So this is the key kind of focus of my research uh, that I'm doing at Oxford now, previously I've been doing similar things at the University of Westminster in London and other places. And for this, for this paper, for this uh, presentation, I, I just wanted to bring an example indeed of Belarus, which is one of the most interesting cases of what's been currently happening with civic organizing, pro-democracy civic organizing in authoritarian, non-democratic countries. And uh, my main premise, the point I start with is this realization that many things indeed changed over the last 10 years in terms of how people get organized to advocate for democratic change 
in uh, not free countries, in authoritarian countries. And um, one of the key observations that many people who do the same type of research make, they find that um, certain potential of digital media indeed changes and provides activists with, new, with, with additional opportunities um, to get organized in different ways. And I would highlight two main, two main uh, uh, specific features of these new types of organizing. On one hand, we observe new mechanisms of, uh, of those structures that activists build in order to promote their messages, to mobilize people, to, um, uh, to solve other issues and pursue other aims. And on the other hand, visibility of activist changes because internet, as you all remember, pr provide very, uh, very specific opportunities for people to hide their identity, to be anonymous, or to the contrary, to highlight their presence. So that's those two main mechanisms I'm looking at in my uh, research. And uh, for those mechanisms, uh, I think the case of Belarus is quite interesting. You might, uh, what, what happens now, for instance, let's take leadership. Yeah? Leadership in civic organizing, in, poli in politics in general. How leaders um, typically been represented uh, previously, traditionally sort of. Very often we think, especially in, in, in when we think of kind of a leader of an opposition in an authoritarian country, we think of a charismatic personality that attracts a lot of attention, that solves all the problem, that leads people who is known to everyone, who unites all sort of good forces against bad guys. So these days, we look at Belarus, for instance. Do we have that type of leaders who are that kind of visible, known, and powerful, charismatic, who can solve any issue, who unite everyone. Well, they might be present, but they're rather symbolic these days, if we talk about known people. But key coordination, key mobilization functions are performed by a bit kind of different leaders. And those leaders are not really known to people. We don't really know who they are and where they are. Uh, specifically when it comes to the case of a recent protest, ongoing protests in Belarus, uh, you might know that um, certain telegram channels, channels that uh, exist on this messaging platform that is very popular across um, many Eastern European countries, um, channels and groups are one of the key mechanisms of organizing and mobilizing people. And I argue that um, the key leaders of this specific movement in Belarus are exactly those people who organize people in those channels and groups on Telegram. And these people are administrators of those channels. And moreover, we, we know some of the names of those people. We know a channel called Nyakta. It translates somebody, someone from Belarusian language. And it's the, the current largest Telegram channel, uh, political Telegram channel in the world. But we don't know many other names we don't know names of those people who work with him, with those uh, with, with person who established this channel. We don't know people who are uh, mobile. We don't know administrators of about 700 different local groups that emerged in Telegram over last month. And those are the key leaders. And what I think is important for us is to understand how to communicate uh, with those people if we want to help them. So if we want to help those type of people, if we want to uh, help them in their, in their struggle for democracy. We need to learn how to communicate, how, how to identify them, and how to, and what are their key needs. And in my paper, I present uh, several types of organizing uh, that we can observe in Belarus, or oh, not sorry, in Belarus, but in authoritarian countries, specifically I focus on Eastern Europe. Uh, I take example of Russia, of Ukraine, uh, and also I take traditional views, traditional examples from say 80s and 70s and 90s when um, people didn't really use that type of technologies they use now and indeed organizing authoritarian states look pretty differently but this type of organizing you can't really see these days that much so what i what i think what i suggest for those organizations specifically international donors people who are involved in democracy promotion across um across authoritarian states what i suggest for them to look at uh, is uh, first of all 
recognize that this type of new organizing that is really common in absorbed not just in states I, I, I named, but also in other countries. Uh, in they, we, we observed this type of organizing in African states recently, in Sudan, for instance. Uh, we observed this type of organizing in Turkey. This organizing becomes more, more and more spread. And we need to recognize that since it becomes more horizontal, it becomes um, less hierarchical. We should uh, recognize that um, we, uh, we're dealing with more fragmented field of civic organizing these days. So one of the key um, uh, kind of takeaways from my paper uh, is the argument that we should uh, understand and we should perhaps recognize that we cannot expect uh, opposition to be as united as we might want or we might, might have seen it before. Opposition would not be as united. Coalitions these days do not function as they used to be. More informal coalition building might be helpful, but rigid coalition bureaucracies, they're damaging because public leaders get isolated, get repressed almost immediately uh, in some places that I mentioned. Other things I, I, I suggest to look at is developing me media skills, developing understanding how to employ those digital uh, platforms uh, efficiently. And this should be really kind of massive efforts because these days I think it's very difficult to function as a civic organizing in these circumstances without employing this type of technologies. Other thing I suggest looking at is um, uh, also avoiding, uh, uh, av avoiding attempts to um, sort of uh, trying to work with traditional partners, and it's, it's good and it's, it's, it's nice to have established partners in the organization, but I think we, in, in a country, but we all, always need to try to, um, try to follow new types uh, of actors, find them and encourage others, uh, our traditional partners in uh, a targeted country to work with new type of organizing I mentioned. Um, perhaps just communicating with those types of new leaders emerging, admins of channels, groups, um, celebrities that uh, post on YouTube about political uh, topics might be a first step in this direction. Uh, I also invite everyone to, to, to look at, at the paper to um, familiarize yourself with the more particular recommendations I make um, and would be very happy to hear your questions and also Veronica's uh, suggestions. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, and welcome, Veronica. Uh, glad that you made it. Um, we already introduced yourself a little bit in your absence, but uh, now there you are. So uh, I'd like to ask you to jump in with your sort of commentary on what Alex said, uh, what he also wrote in his paper, obviously, uh, and your additional perspective uh, from Belarus, but not only, uh, clearly. Uh, uh, in this uh, in this round, Veronica. Hi everyone. First of all, thank uh, thank you very much for having me, and uh, apologies for being late. Uh, I was struggling with my computer for about thirty minutes, and uh, this is another proof how dependent we are on technology these days, and how actually we should work uh, more closer with the uh, digital uh, transformation of uh, the overall reality we are living in. First, I would like to say that I think uh, papers like Alessis are really are important and relevant now. I think that it is amazing what is happening in Belarus in terms of that is uh, really like a testing ground for changes, which uh, Alessis also pointed out in his paper and which I'm writing about are going to happen um, uh, in other countries too. Um, I think there we have very unique um, momentum now when our, there is a certain um, actually good, there are certain good trends happening in Eastern Europe in terms of digital media and independent media, uh, unlike um, this disinformation and the digital or let's say abuse of power happening in Western Europe and the US. Uh, so if, there, if this is the chance for the good to win over the evil, I think this is uh, something which is really exciting and something which we should be closely uh, looking at and monitoring. Uh, so when, uh, when I was doing my initial uh, research on influencers with uh, my colleagues and with the Digital Communication Network uh, some time ago, we did realize that there is a huge potential of uh, 
uh, digital dissidents, as Alice is calling them, or digital influencers in political social sphere in the region because of the um, issues with the free speech on one hand and uh, the lack of independent uh, media landscape, proper one in authoritarian countries, but on the other hand, because of the rapid change of um, digital world, because of the uh, proximity and uh, um, uh, better access to technology uh, by just people overall all over the world. So now um, when I started to uh, focus in more last year to uh, at the this influencers in Central and Eastern Europe, it was also incredibly important to see how they are trying now to shape um, landscape and even political landscape, not just digital in uh, additional countries. For instance, if we took an example of Slovakia and elections which were happening um, at the beginning of this year, uh, there were actors on the digital influencer sphere, like Zomri, who were actually shaping the public discourse over the politicians when they, they were having uh, parliamentary elections in Slovakia. And uh, I do think that uh, many people were expecting something similar happening uh, in Eastern Europe. And as our uh, Alexis researchers approves and as what practice showed and what we were looking at, this is for sure uh, what is happening in Belarus and uh, uh, there is, uh, so this trend will definitely continue. I think that uh, an important thing is that we also should um, watch closely how uh, independent, more traditional, let's say, media are behaving in, the, in, this, in this situation, in this set of circumstances. Um, you probably know that uh, when there was a blockage on the internet in Belarus for several days, basically all the websites with independent news were blocked. Um, this uh, news platform, these newsrooms, they had to switch quickly to our social media platforms because there was no other way how to communicate uh, to the audience the relevant news. Uh, in the places with the similar issues uh, with the freedom of speech, uh, with um, authoritarian regimes, as um, Alexis mentioned, there are many of them all over the world. This might be a new trend. Uh, this, is, this is already a new trend and this is um, uh, already something which donors, stakeholders, uh, media experts and professionals should be taking into consideration. Uh, we are now really getting over this uh, to a new, absolutely new stage of uh, digital media when many of these platforms will be moving to channels which are protected from uh, the interference of the authoritarian leaders like Telegram in Belarus. And uh, this means that we have to reshape also our thinking, how we uh, perceive information and how we perceive independent media. And I'll probably stop there for, for the discussion. Thank you very much, Veronica, uh, and compliments to both of you for being so concise in your uh, in your presentations. That leaves us with enough time for uh, for questions to uh, to both of you. There are questions coming in already. I do encourage everybody to uh, bring them into the chat uh, to the chat function here. Uh, let me perhaps myself start with uh, with a question because uh, uh, Alice, you mentioned that. Uh, uh, sort of the, the the very idea of leadership uh, uh, is uh, somewhat challenged here um, because uh, leadership is something that has to do also with uh, with typically with visibility with interaction uh, sort of on a uh, on a visible level uh, whereas you clearly pointed out that uh, there are there are elements of leadership here that remain uh, invisible that uh, many do, don't even probably acknowledge as such because uh, these are uh, administrators of individual uh, telegram channels or other uh, or other platforms so um, I was wondering here whether uh, one, perhaps in the context of Belarus, you can you can characterize those uh, uh, those people. They don't necessarily have to be named, even. Uh, what are the and what are the kind of qualities that they actually have in order to step into those functions as uh, 
digitally enabled organizers, as digital dissidents, uh, uh, who are those? Who are those people? Because there is something somewhat obscure about this, I find, and uh, obviously also when it comes to questions of uh, assistance uh, um, uh, to those uh, to those movements, uh, there has to be a human level interaction in uh, in most cases. So it would probably help us if, if we could understand all a little better who who are these individuals that are uh, that are so forceful in in this digital space? Yeah, indeed, it's a great question. And indeed, we need to pay a lot of attention to leadership. As I mentioned, um, it seems like that um, being public sometimes is dangerous. And indeed, uh, Belarus been described as, for, as, as, as preemptive uh, authoritarian regime, which means that uh, uh, country, uh, country's government tries to preempt any threats to to its uh, structure, to the system, by isolating potential challengers in advance. And that's what we see right now in Belarus, when essentially everyone who, uh, during the, this stage of, uh, of, of the protest, announced their, uh, their opposition and became prominent, they are now all, in, all imprisoned or abroad. So uh, other types of leadership uh, uh, becomes more successful in this regard, and specifically those people who know how to keep anonymous if they remain inside the country. And it's one of the key, perhaps, uh, it's, it's related to one of the key skills of those people. They should remain technically savvy, they should be advanced uh, in use of most sort of reliable techniques and technologies, but it doesn't really require them to be any type of IT specialist or anyone who has uh, say kind of IT degree or something. It's not really required in that level. They just rather need to be curious about technologies and these type of things can be learned quite easily. And the uh, second step, they should, should of course pay attention to their identity and security online. Other important thing is, is um, what I found in my research is that those people are normally, especially these days, um, they are also quite entrepreneurial. So it's in a sense, they know how to use various um, kind of approaches and management, how to sometimes manage people, how to organize people, small groups, larger groups. They have these skills, not necessarily, uh, many of them are coming from business background, but some of them just sort of naturally know these type of things. Other thing, this especially relates to, um, to those people who use more visual types of platforms like YouTube, they, uh, especially if they present themselves, if they reveal their face, uh, they, uh, that, that's where charisma is, is needed perhaps. And one of the key uh, sort of political bloggers of Belarus, uh, uh, who is now in prison, Sergei Sikhanovsky, he, he, he was definitely charismatic, at least on camera. So those people know how to be charismatic with, uh, with those technologies. Um, and other thing is uh, perhaps I found that uh, those people constantly want to learn and now know how to learn. So it's, it's not about knowledge, but rather a process of discovering new things. And it all relates to, uh, I think, what we, uh, what we not need to know how, in terms of communication with those people. Uh, sometimes they're very secretive, sometimes they're not really open to sort of new contacts, um, especially if the contacts uh, sort of, if people approach them from other countries, for instance either these journalists or uh, say NGO workers. So here people need to be ca cautious very much about not to um, raise the level of suspicion among those people. In that respect, I would re I recommended my paper thinking about, uh, in terms of helping those people, thinking about developing and building crowdfunding or donating infrastructure. So uh, those people can receive support, not from elsewhere, but within their country. And in case of many authoritarian case, uh, countries, crowdfunding infrastructure is very restricted. We can't really imagine how difficult sometimes it is being a citizen of say Belarus or Azerbaijan to, and try to support independent media or support uh, uh, an NGO that is more or less engaged in politics. And in that respect, uh, I think quite creative solutions are needed, but also a lot of attention to this sphere is needed because those people we're talking about, they're not necessarily open to say direct support from, 
from other players except for their own citizens. Thanks, Alice. I don't know, Veronica, you want to come in on this? Um, yeah, I would just add a few things so coming from my own experience because during my research within the uh, Everything C uh, Fellowship, I conducted about 50 uh, interviews in six countries, it's Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, uh, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. And um, what I noticed is that um, actually half of these uh, digital influencers in this political sphere, the digital dissidents, as Alessia is calling them, are, have, do have a journalistic background and they do understand how to work with information, with information flow, how to work with the audience, how to track it, how to keep it uh, um, attentive and focused on what they're saying. So this proves to us once again that um, of course, there is a, like technology is developing very rapidly. We need to uh, get used to it and we need to uh, keep up with it. Uh, but we still um, need to realize that very often um, such people um, have this basic journalistic skills, which are also donors and stakeholders have to keep going, especially in countries where there is a problem with the freedom of speech and where journalism has been kind of um, very much repressed independent journalism and only um, pro state for governmental uh, news agencies are working freely but this is not real journalism on if we compare it for uh, their international level journalism so i think this is also an important uh, point here yeah. thanks uh, there's a question that closely relates uh, that's come in uh, in the chat there are several um, but i'm picking this out uh, at this stage because it relates uh, which comes from John Paul Gravelines, uh, and the question is, do you foresee an enhanced role for civil society organizations, whether in Belarus or, uh, or elsewhere, uh, to play a role in supporting and coordinating the use of technologies uh, amongst, user, uh, um, amongst leaders and influencers? Uh, so the question here is, uh, the question a minute ago was basically, I mean, who are these, uh, who are these people? What's the kind of profile here? And the question now from John Paul to, to add on this is, uh, how can that be supported? How can that be cultivated? Uh, uh, can civil society organizations uh, uh, have an impact on sort of uh, creating that, uh, uh, that milieu of people that is, uh, that is so important in the digital space? Uh, Alice? Yeah, th uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Veronica, for um, the yeah, additional thought on journalism. Indeed, it's very relevant, I think, and indeed, I think um, we can help them and play a role in coordinating and uh, supporting them and uh, supporting the use of these technologies. Um, and uh, in fact, help can be, can take an expected form sometime. Um, And one of these, for instance, very simple, is actually enabling those people, uh, influencers or yeah, yeah, or dissidents, to 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 reach wider audiences. And this this is what, <clears throat> in fact, internet uh, provides us with instruments such as advertisements, such as uh, techniques to boost their profile. But normally, of course, it should be done organically, naturally. It it works much better. So I would say training. I would say um, kind of um, updating people who are interested uh, in, the, in these things is the first step. And the second step would be providing when, with instruments and tools. In fact, uh, when it comes to uh, cases of countries with restricted internet, and Belarus increasingly becomes an example. There are many others, unfortunately, especially Central Asia, um, also countries that go through protest uh, stages uh, like recently Algeria, for instance, internet get restricted, key leading websites get banned, people cannot access them. So in fact, uh, it's very important for people to get in free information and developing uh, sort of worldwide, worldwide support for developing technologies to reach wider uh, population in the circumstances of blockade, uh, of internet shutdown is very important. That's why uh, Telegram messaging platform became that perhaps popular in Belarus over the last weeks. It's because during internet shutdown, when essentially internet wasn't available for most of the, uh, more than for, for more than 60 hours, 
uh, in, most of the news websites were not available, um, including state ones. Uh, Telegram <clears throat> sort of rapidly enhanced its infrastructure and provided ordinary citizens of Belarus with an opportunity to access at least text-based type information. So it was very helpful when private company, when private uh, organizations with significant technological capabilities help in this type of circumstances. And what I, what, that's what I think we need to think about. We need to think about uh, helping ordinary citizens to access unsettled information and sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, making those efforts uh, more visible and also more um, sort of influential in a way. That would be one of the key, uh, key uh, kind of help that uh, uh, people around the world can, can, can pr provide. Thanks, Alice. Uh, since, uh, since you drilled down a little bit already uh, into the Telegram question, there is a question here from Benedict Williams uh, uh, as to uh, who owns Telegram, who runs it. Uh, maybe uh, there's quite a few uh, amongst us who, uh, who don't actually know what Telegram is and, and how it exactly functions. Um, perhaps you can add a few words on that uh, particular format of a, a social medium, Alice. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. Uh, very simply, so Telegram been established uh, about five years ago uh, by a Russian businessman who was forced out of the country. He was forced to sell his stake in another popular social media company, and he moved uh, moved away. And uh, since he experienced issues with privacy, with surveillance in Russia. He established this platform that cherishes uh, anti-censorship sort of um, ideology. And uh, since then, the uh, company wasn't uh, profitable. It didn't provide, produce any profit as far as we know. And uh, in general, it was um, kind of rather an attempt to, of course, of course, there, there are some, uh, they, these people who own it, they have ideas how to monetize it, but they didn't do it. And perhaps it helped to make it sort of, uh, an environment where political discussion is happening in countries like Iran, in Central Asian countries, also in, in Ukraine and other places already mentioned. Um, so essentially it's, it's, it's uh, uh, an example of so far non-profit sort of initiative that, that, um, that forces political discussions in, in authoritarian countries. But in the West, of course, it plays a bit different role in media ecology because it's been populated by uh, other types of actors, not, not necessarily that nice people. And here, but we need to really dis distinguish those two cases, how Telegram is used, is used in, say, Eastern Europe in authoritarian countries and how it's been used in, say, Germany or UK. It's, they're two very different cases. Um, and, uh, yeah, we shouldn't really be discouraged by the, the abuse of this platform in the West to help people who use it in the, in the East. Thanks. Still, this builds a good bridge to another question that came from Raphael Goldzweig at uh, Democracy Reporting International, uh, who asks about the pros and the cons, uh, um, pretty much what you, what you indicated already. Uh, we see on the one hand this very strong positive uh, potential of uh, media like, uh, like Telegram channels for social mobilization. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, and you indicated already for different contexts, there is a potential here also for abuse, for disinformation, for manipulation. Uh, is there any such risk uh, 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 at the moment, if you look at the Belarus situation in particular, uh, that some of these uh, some, some of these cons come to the come to the fore, Alice? Yeah, well, indeed, um, it's uh, disinformation can be very context specific. And in, in case of Belarus or in case of uh, maybe Russia as well itself uh, and similar countries, uh, actors that spread this information, they, were much, they are much more visible and they are much closer to the government than in many Western countries. So in case of Belarus, this information has been traditionally spread by state media, specifically most influential channel of media, which is television, almost everywhere. And television is still very powerful, including Belarus. So state television was the main source of disinformation in Belarus for decades. 
And in fact, the, uh, the, the, the situation when this state media, for different reasons, lost its persuasive power over the last couple of, or several months, I, I think contributed to the current unrest in Belarus. So somehow people do not trust television anymore. They more and more trust influencers on YouTube at means of Telegram channels rather than uh, commentators on state TV. This is one key actor. Another key actor of disinformation in, in, in many post-Soviet countries is Russia, which is in general one of the most potent disinformation actors in the world. Uh, but in contrast to say, um, say for instance, uh, what we've seen in, in the US, what we might have seen in some other countries uh, or, or some other democracies, Russia doesn't really use automatic manipulative tools to spread disinformation in Belarus. It focuses on kind of more traditional techniques. Again, television, which is very popular. Very, you can say much more on that, I believe, but just uh, here I would summarize more recent things we've seen is that, uh, is that interestingly, uh, what, what's happening now is uh, when many people who've been working on state television, state media in Belarus, they, they left, they left those enterprises, they left those organizations because of the protest, during the protest, um, the joint protest movement in a way, they've been replaced. And who replaced them? They've been replaced by, it mostly were technical workers in fact, it wasn't that many journalists who left, but still they left, it paralyzed the production process on television for some time, and that could be replaced them. People from Russia, from a channel called RT, RT, that is perhaps known to most of you. So this is a state-owned television that mostly broadcasts um, abroad, but also been used, it also broadcasts in Russia. It shows that, in fact, uh, Russia is a potent player and it's, it keeps trying to uh, use its influence um, using propaganda techniques. And Baby Livrenka can, if she's around, if she can hear us, can add something, but I think she's not available. She has just unfortunately dropped <laughs> off, just as I wanted to uh, come back to her on this, uh, uh, on this question, because I think uh, from her uh, interviews with ever so many influencers, she would be able to give us a, a, a good sense also on the question, uh, how, you can, how you can keep people responsible, as it were, uh, how, how they can stick to a certain ethos here and not succumb to some of these, these more negative effects. Uh, but we will come back to that once uh, once Veronica is uh, back online. Um, there's a question from uh, from my colleague Jonathan Katz in uh, uh, in Washington, uh, and this is a question that I know you cover in your uh, in your paper. And this is about the intersection between more traditional civil society organizations on the one hand, and these new forms of leadership organizing uh, in the in the civic and digital space on the other. Uh, how these can be how these can be related to one another how uh, how you can establish forms of cooperation between uh, between these two realms because there is a more traditional and obviously a more more modern digital realm uh, emerging here in civil society so how can we sort of think these uh, together and uh, uh, help them develop uh, sort of cross fertilization as it were uh, Alice? Yeah, well, indeed, it's, it's, a, it's an important issue we, think we should think about, and I offer a very particular solution to this. I suggest that, um, essentially, more traditional actors, for instance, um, for instance um, unions of journalists or, or kind of umbrella organizations of large NGOs, uh, they should really aim at communicating with newer actors, with smaller more auto, auto, atomized actors, localized, I call them segmented or segment, um, segment types of groups that kind of pop up like mushrooms after rain and then disappear very often, very, 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 very fast sometime. Um, they might not really support strong links and strong links are not useful because sometimes strong links might lead to um, to revealing identities or revealing infrastructures uh, in terms of, in case of repression is dangerous. 
But weaker links, links weaker uh, sort of uh, communication is important. And for that, I offer establishing, actually, sometimes even requiring from uh, larger say, organizations inside the country that have been supported uh, to, to sort of establish and um, kind of dashboard, establish um, um, sort of uh, one of the aims, and this aim actually can be quantified how extensive, but also how often the frequent contacts are between large organizations and more traditional partners and smaller those types of segmented units I'm looking at. Uh, example could be, for instance, uh, as, as, as Veronica mentioned, journalistic skills broadly defined, not specifically knowledge how to write a specific type of journalist text, but rather just general understanding how to communicate with people, how to interact as part of public communication might be helpful, right? So if journalistic skills helpful, why not uh, unions of journalists offer trainings not just to journalists, but also to those types of new uh, communicators and uh, administrators? Um, this might be one of the uh, very immediate uh, solution, I think, that can be implemented rapidly. Um, yeah, there could be others, but I think very good and she can answer the previous question. <laughs> Now, if Veronica is back and hear us and uh, also speak, then uh, we'll come back to you now right away with, uh, with that question. Um, there is a couple of questions that emerge about the sort of the, the upsides and the downsides, obviously. Uh, and one that more specifically asked by a number of people actually has something to do with, uh, with accountability uh, of those who uh, sort of very actively use uh, individual social media channels, build a following, build a credibility there, uh, a certain authority, if you, uh, if you will. Uh, but there's obviously a, a question here, and you may be able to answer this uh, uh, from, your, from your interviews with many of those influencers, is uh, what, what is their sense of responsibility? What is the, uh, the ethos that also regulates what they do and what they don't? Uh, because uh, here, obviously, this is also a space that can be uh, where sort of a large followership can also be misled by, uh, uh, by those more or less visible individuals. Um, so what, is the, uh, what are the boundaries here that, uh, that they feel uh, they have themselves? And how can these perhaps also be reinforced? I mean, what can, can there be a level of accountability to their, uh, to their behavior? Veronica? This is a great question, and then I will actually, with this answer, we'll get back to one of the previous questions from our audience. So I think when I was uh, talking to um, our influencer dissidents, all of them are aware of ethics and of their responsibility, like all those who, of course, do not spread this information, but I wasn't speaking to, uh, speaking to these ones. And um, I have a feeling that they're still really um, are trying to find the, a, good, a good balance how to remain ethical, but also how to remain informative. So many of them uh, do make mistakes, but uh, a good thing is that they're learning on their mistakes and then they apologize. If, for instance, they spread this information by mistake or something like this. And for this reason, I think it is very important to, um, for this uh, type of dissidents still to um, go along with, um, with the main principles of um, ethical journalism. And that is why, in my opinion, it's better when they do have this journalistic background and they are, um, stick to the principles of truth and objectivity, um, ethics, and they're trying to uh, kind of spread this uh, ideology on, whatever, on everything they do. But also, I think that uh, it is a great opportunity for NGOs, but also for governments, for various stakeholders, uh, where they can work together with this emerging um, influencers, creators, dissidents, uh, where they can actually teach uh, them uh, something they're missing if they, for instance, uh, have no journalistic background or have no background in civil society. And this might be a great area for, for them to cooperate. Uh, there is a good example of um, 
this kind of initiative so it's uh, there is uh, something which uh, a great organization which is called uh, digital um, uh, influencers hub, influencers hub moldova where are basically people who have NGOs civil society background they work on a daily basis uh, with influencers from different spheres and they um, also are uh, carry out with them projects on uh, um, on the literacy, on media literacy, on uh, disinformation, and there they connect um, initiatives from uh, the UN, from um, some international organizations or some media outlets, um, for instance, um, uh, also uh, this uh, very important journalistic organization who promote these principles, and they kind of uh, teach influencers how to um, operate in this um, field. Uh, more ethically, and how to uh, uh, um, to be aware, to realize the responsibility they carry on their shoulders, which is really enormous if we especially look at what Alice is saying, also a huge audience keeps growing um, basically everywhere for them. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, there's a related question that came from Katarina Pichikova. Um, the uh, whether it's telegram or other social media or the sort of digital means as it were they're obviously not exclusive to those who uh, um, uh, who aim for a civic democratic discourse development uh, so the question here is especially also in the in the context of uh, of belarus whether uh, you know of instances where pro-regime actors uh, are actively trying to, as it were, pollute the, uh, uh, this space. Uh, and perhaps adding from my end, what kind of mechanisms there are or can be uh, for sort of social media hygiene to, uh, to have a self, um, self-regulating, uh, filtering process, as it were, to keep some of those, uh, whether it's pro-regime or otherwise extremist um, uh, influences out of that, uh, out of that discourse. Alice? I think in terms of filtering, in fact, what I've seen previously with other movements and other types of, uh, say, wider civic engagement, is very often people themselves are quite capable of filtering very basic manipulation if it starts happening. So if those activists we're talking about start somehow abusing their influence, or very often it happens when people sort of change their teams, when sort of uh, people who established mm, their, a page online or a community, they leave for some reason and other people become leaders, very often it uh, also results in change of the communication style and also agenda. And people leave this type of communities. They don't, they, they do vote themselves with their legs when they go and say, no, we don't want to follow that anymore. So in fact, this is one of, actually there is a strong filter that been introduced by audiences themselves. Obviously there are people skeptical to all types of disinformation, manipulation and propaganda, but it doesn't mean that mm, the majority of people are that skeptical to that. Uh, in terms of um, state actors that have been involved in manipulating online, I think uh, uh, state actors have been involved all across the world. Uh, research of, um, of our institute, Internet Institute at Oxford, where uh, I do research as well, um, suggests that more than 80 states had teams, not necessarily they've been state sponsored, but very often they are. Uh, uh, so 80, 80 countries uh, contained actors who've been using automatic, semi-automatic techniques to manipulate online uh, information. What else uh, is happening in Belarus specifically is uh, when Telegram became that big as a messenger. And in fact, uh, we, might, we might see that it can be very easily polluted uh, as in the case of Russia, but so far it's not polluted with political misinformation, but government do certainly try to do this. They try to pollute it. They try to follow very often the style of organizing that's been exhibited in, uh, by the activists. So in fact, uh, state propaganda tries to mimic the style of organizing and information spread that's been uh, uh, shown, displayed during the current events in Belarus by activists, by pro-democracy activists. But they are not so far successful at all. Uh, for instance, uh, it's clear that there are about 1 million followers. So 10%, more than 10% of 
population. More than 15% of all internet users follow just one uh, Telegram channel that I mentioned, Nechta, and it's pro-democracy, pro-movement channel. Uh, so more than 15% of users. But um, uh, the largest channel, uh, pro-government, sort of pro-regime channel, is in fact uh, uh, just, it, it's led by the press secretary of, of, of the president. It's been followed uh, by uh, just, I think, 10, 8 or 8% 8, 8 of that number. So more than 10 times less people follow it. It, it, it shows that uh, uh, efforts of government are not successful. And the reason for their inability to be successful, in fact, is their inability to adapt the logic, I think, the logic of, 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 uh, of um, information dissemination that's been, that been shown by activists in Belarus. So state tries to regulate everything in Belarus, and they try to control everything cent from centralized perspectives hierarchically. And this, as we can see, doesn't work with this type of information. Thanks. <laughs> Veronica, uh, you have a take on that? Uh, I would also add uh, maybe a little bit on um, also what um, um, I would say Kremlin, initi Kremlin led initiatives were trying to do recently in terms of Belarusian uh, telegram. So they started to, as Alice say, into, in order to mimic kind of this logic, set up their own telegram channels, pretending that they are independent new news channels. And then um, they started to uh, slowly infiltrate this, this information there and um, just change the agenda. So I think that there is indeed now um, this um, understanding that Telegram is like the thing in Belarus at the moment. And uh, there will be a lot of actors who will be now trying to discredit it, to discredit the information, to discredit uh, people who are independently running certain channels. So this is something also we should um, uh, be watching uh, closely and uh, realizing that uh, kind of this information war is not over at all, even though there are positive changes in Belarus. Uh, we should be prepared for more information attacks and as we know technology is growing, but also uh, IT are specialist hackers are learning very fast as well. And we also know about instances when uh, during the election campaign in Belarus, several major uh, important telegram channels who were, for instance, uh, monitoring their uh, elections or uh, registering their ballots. It was a special platform created by this, uh, by our um, uh, joint headquarters. It was also hacked. So uh, we kind of have to be always alert and cautious still. And uh, this is also another kind of fascinating topic to, to, to monitor, to uh, discuss, but also to be aware of also for the stakeholders. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, perhaps a question from my end, um, not just Belarus, but again, it's a good example. But uh, uh, when we look at sort of the history of, uh, uh, of the last 20 years then, uh, or even more, uh, uh, initially sort of the digital space sort of was a big promise for democracy participation. Uh, so there was a first sort of uh, enormous uh, expectation that was uh, that was launched at uh, at the digital space, and some of this uh, about 20 years ago in various countries uh, also seemed to materialize. Uh, then there was a backlash where, and you described that also in uh, in your paper, Alice, uh, where uh, autocrats copped onto. Uh, digital technologies and start using it for surveillance, for repressions, for obviously propaganda and disinformation. Uh, and now with the Billows example, also uh, some of the observations in your paper, uh, it seems a little bit that this pendulum is, uh, is swinging back, um, that there is more of a, of a promise again, as it were, in, uh, uh, in digital technologies when it comes to sort of democratic developments. Um, why is it that uh, uh, in a place like uh, like Belarus, the Lukashenko regime that is sort of, I mean, quite aware of, of digital technologies, there's a strong IT sector in, uh, in the country, why does it seem that they are so, uh, so surprised by this, that they've been, they've been overwhelmed by, uh, by this recent very digitally driven uh, mobilization? What are your sort of yeah. thoughts on that, Alice. I think, I think indeed you're absolutely right to suggest that essentially uh, new technologies create as many solutions as problems, right? So for every solution, there is a new problem 
and we see it a lot in democracies. Uh, in authoritarian countries, there is a bit more promise time again, perhaps. Um, and uh, I think this dynamics is, is quite universal, in fact, because what we have seen, I think, in any context is that technologies give voice to underrepresented, to, to people who've been not heard before, who've been sort of hidden from the um, mainstream view. And in authoritarian countries, those people who've been hidden, they're, who've been censored, they are exactly dissidents, they are people from different political, with different political opinion. And uh, uh, those people have been always trying to find their voice, but in order to have a stronger voice, they also need to have stronger audience, right? They need to have people who are gonna listen and hear from them. And here, in fact, I think one of the reasons why we see this uh, sort of promise time, observe this promise time in some uh, countries like Belarus is that, in fact, just many more people are joining more kind of visual types of platforms where political visualized content like YouTube is much easier to consume than just read many multiple texts with uh, those um, endless ideas. It's much easier to listen, to see, to watch more kind of uh, charismatic, sometimes more populist speech by uh, a dissident or a person who been censored previously from state media, then just read their interviews and so on. I think just audiences are growing, but also in case of uh, uh, countries where on the one hand IT se sector is developed, and on the other hand, governments are not aware of kind of consequences of this development. If perhaps, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a general problem of many authoritarian states, I think. They're just not capable of getting kind of feedback right and on time. They just uh, often not listen and are not able to have those channels that would bring them uh, information what's happening in society in real time. And this is kind of structural problem of, of a dictatorship in a way. It's, it's, it exists in China, it exists in Russia, it exists in Belarus. It's not new or unique. What's unique in Belarus is that uh, certainly election campaign, presidential election campaign opened this opportunity for dissidents, for opposition to speak, to speak up and uh, government didn't get it right totally. They didn't understand this changing landscape of political organizing that changed and they are all traditional techniques of isolating public, visible, charismatic leaders didn't work. They didn't understand it on time. And it, I think, gave, gave leverage to, to, the, to the protest. Yeah, thank you. Veronica? Yes, I, I, I really I think this is a fantastic question, York, and uh, I think Alex put it on um, the very nice way. We just said a few things. I think this is absolutely correct that um, we have to understand that in authoritarian countries, leaders sometimes are too self-confident to realize that something has changed, but also an information sphere. For instance, this year we were doing with, um, I think, 10 based in uh, Slovakia and Bratislava, Memo 98, monitoring of our social media in Belarus together with my colleagues. And we created a report, which was brilliantly called um, a digital, um, I think, um, an analog, analog campaign by Lukashenko in the digital era. So whilst the technology has moved, uh, their mindset of authoritarian leader uh, in this case, Lukashenko remained in an analog era. Era, and uh, even though there is this high um, high uh, tech IT park in Minsk, and there are so many uh, IT wonderful startups operating in Belarus, uh, the leadership never really. Uh, unfortunately perceived it as a, something they should learn from rather as a, just a source of additional income and uh, I don't know a good image on the international level but they were so self-confident and so arrogant in a way that they didn't actually realize until the very last moment that they have to learn a lot from what is happening there in this area in Minsk and that um, information space has been transformed and changing and this is something they should 
uh, be really uh, looking at and uh, monitoring and following. So I think this kind of also unites other authoritarian countries where leaders who have been there for decades are so confident in their power that they lose this uh, track of changes and uh, lose this connection with the population and their interest in digital technologies and uh, the transformations which are happening there. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, let's close this off uh, with two questions that take us uh, back to Belarus more uh, specifically. Uh, the one is from Katarina Pishikova, uh, uh, who asks whether the ongoing protests uh, will somehow be able to convince Alexander Lukashenko to step down. Uh, so what is the what is the prospect here for Belarus to basically get out of this stalemate that we've seen for a number of weeks uh, now where you have the regime basically digging in its heels and on the other hand, uh, social mobilization, digitally enabled as it is, uh, 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 remaining strong. So the question here is, I mean, uh, moving forward where um, uh, where does this uh, potentially end or uh, find an exit from the current uh, situation? And the second one is, uh, is more from myself. That is, I mean, uh, uh, unless you have uh, you have a lot of uh, suggestions in your paper also how uh, how this development this digitally enabled dissidents mobilization uh, can be uh, and should be supported from the outside. Uh, uh, if you both take take that angle. What is it at the moment uh, that is needed most in Belarus? Beyond all the political questions of sanctions and what should be done, but is there anything that can be done from the outside uh, to support this, uh, uh, this very large social mobilization and its, uh, its digital underpinnings, uh, as it were? Is there anything immediately necessary that could be, uh, that could be helpful and constructive here? Uh, with those two questions, I'll take it back to you. And this time around, I'm going to ask Veronica first. Thank you so much for this question. So uh, I think that in terms of uh, immediate support, what is really necessary at the moment is support of, uh, and we will not be probably original here with the less independent journalism and independent um, or digital initiatives. Um, now, when we know that uh, Belarusian authorities have started to track, or, and uh, already in June they put into jail at least uh, five bloggers, uh, there is uh, such a big need for alternative information that uh, independent media really struggling with all their oppressions, with all their fines, uh, and also with their abuse of uh, information technologies when these websites are, are simply got uh, get uh, blocked and uh, disconnected from our, their audience, which is Belarus. So I think uh, this is what is needed. And of course, what is also needed very much is uh, um, support of especially journalism in smaller towns and cities, because uh, the situation is there is, uh, in most cases, is much worse. And there are only a few voices from these smaller towns and cities which demonstrated bravery and also social mobilization during protests now. Uh, that also need to be uh, supported a lot. Uh, so this would be my take, I think, on uh, digital immediate support. Yeah. Thank you. And Alice? Well, um, I would take a bit more pessimistic stance. And let's imagine that the question, the first question you asked, what, what would persuade Lukashenko to step down? Uh, the answer would be like, there is nothing <laughs> To, that can persuade him, and he remains. Let's imagine that. And I think it's good to be prepared for worst case scenario. And partly because in my research, I'm looking at less sort of optimistic places and countries. And I think what is important now in, in general is in fact, do what I suggest in paper, try to reach out immediately to smaller groups that emerged as a result of this process that are not represented by any type of formal organizing that exists essentially like digital collectives. Reach out essentially to those six or 750 telegram channel groups. All of them have leaders, all of them have more active people, all of them have less active people and uh, but what most of them 
don't have is knowledge and experience of civic work in say in in sort of a long more long term struggle type scenario they definitely don't know even context of what's been happening in belarus because most of those people were not interested in politics at all they've been trying to hide away from politics and what now happened they all became interested in politics but beyond that interest many of them don't know much so i would really encourage and it's actually work first of all for, for similar ngos that exist in belarus experienced ngos to reach them to reach out to them and try and at least to communicate basic ideas offer support offer basic sort of background and what type of things uh, they've been doing just teach them and give them opportunity to learn a bit that would be the, the first step i think so establish connection establish communication because those groups that emerge they will remain people will remain in them and if it won't be done by say experienced pro-democracy activists uh, this type of communication this communication will be established by the pro-regime types and this movement will be hijacked by other types of people so i think um, that's where our attention should be directed mm -hmm. communication with local groups that emerged and in terms of immediate support for, that can be done say from for, uh, by international organizations i think the most potent actor in the current belarus revolt crisis revolution is is trade unions and what we learned about attempts of trade unions att attempts of workers to have strikes which really shaked the system it really it really changed the balance for some time when they started striking and it it, it didn't last for long but it's, it's happened and then it finished why because uh, strike requires much more sort of formal organization it requires structures and i think kind of stepping up the work and helping those collectives helping uh, people who want to establish their trade union organizations even not and even not officially registered but even partly informal but i think those people uh, they're sort of one of the most vulnerable uh, actors in belarus some of them are going to lose their jobs some of them will remain they might they will continue some of them continue pursuing similar goals that they've been doing over the last weeks and those people might need uh, immediate help so i think uh, uh, we should direct attention to them as well thank you very much uh, we are at the end already of our session i think it added a lot of nuance uh, not only to uh, to what we uh, know about and, and observe in belarus but also uh, also beyond uh, and to add even more of that, I certainly encourage you all to uh, to take a closer look at uh, Alessi's paper. Uh, I shared the link here in the chat, but uh, we can certainly also uh, send it around if you uh, if you wish. You should certainly also stay tuned for the paper that uh, Veronica is uh, preparing, that is on a very related uh, issue, as you uh, as you heard. Uh, I'm left with saying thank you to uh, especially Veronica and uh, Alice for their, uh, for their insights here, uh, to all of you for the many questions that you asked and for, for joining us in the, in the first place, to uh, Elisabeth, my colleague who has been uh, critical in uh, pulling all of this together and making sure that it also works, uh, works technically and smoothlessly. Uh, let me close this with a brief piece of advertising as it were. Uh, we will have a next uh, event discussion uh, uh, within this framework uh, in two weeks' time uh, on the 5th of October. Uh, the topic then will be uh, rule of law in the European Union. You may know that there's an effort on the part of the European Commission to get a stronger monitoring uh, mechanism in place to, uh, to track uh, rule of law uh, developments and also abuses in the, inside of the European Union. Uh, this will be uh, organized and led by my colleague Daniel Hegedusch. Uh, so the invitation will go out also to all of you very soon. On the 5th of October, we have the next of these uh, events online, and I hope to see many of you joining us for that. Many thanks again. Uh, until such time that you join us next, uh, stay safe and all the best. <laughs>